All right, how many of you watched that show? All right, about, well, we had about half in the first service. We have some liars in this service. Let's see. But show, I, I, have a, I have the real blessing of a wife who likes that show, so I watch it sometimes. There's a few different kinds of house hunters that amuse me. Uh, the first is one that's become this big internet joke of what these people do in order to achieve their budget. Like, um, so I'm reading jokes. These aren't real stories, but people joke about the insanity of it, right? Husband says, I'm a free, freelance hamster trainer. The wife says, I tune harmonicas part-time. Our budget is $950,000. The next one, a husband, I give slide, slide whistle lessons. The wife, I'm a stay-at-home astronaut. Our budget is $1.6 million. <laughs> or uh, how about a 23-year-old 20, sous chef? The wife is a freelance artist, and they have a loose budget of $750,000 plus renovations. Okay, well, that's one kind of house hunter. And then there's, there's this one that's also really fascinating. This is more on, this episode is different because they'll say, listen, we have, we have a budget of $250,000. It's strict. We've got to stick to it. And the realtor says, okay, great. I've got one that's slightly over budget. It comes in right at $1 million, <laughs> but it's got a really nice shower door that slides really fast. But then there are others that are, uh, that are really grumbly. They just grumble about everything, like the carpet lady. I, d I can't handle people like this, personally. But, you know, you'll see this on that show, too. The husband will say, listen, this house is great. $200,000 under budget. It's got a really quick commute to work. And the wife will say, yeah? But I really wanted an alcove on my bedroom. Where do they find these people? But what's worse is we're capable grumblers too. Uh, sometimes I think as we're watching this is that we're just watching ourselves. But the camera isn't on us broadcast on cable news all the time. Like the things that we ourselves say may not be that wildly different than what the house hunters people say. We are capable grumblers. I've seen some grumbling in the news this week as well over television shows. Now, TV as, as an industry is in incredible decline, at least in terms of live engagement. So in 1980, 100 million people tuned in to find out who shot JR. 100 million people. Now, some of you don't know what I'm talking about. For those of you who are younger than me, I don't know who shot JR. I just know JR was shot. That's my generation. Some of, you, some of you know exactly who JR was shot, and we're among the 100 million people, right? Now, this week, two shows are going off the air that have incredible engagement. A lot of people watch. The first one already went off the air called The Big Bang Theory. It's the number one show on TV, and 18 million people watched the final episode, which, again, is down 20% from the biggest show 30, 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, right? That's wild how few people watch TV relative in the past. These, uh, these show ratings that shows get today uh, would have been a bad episode of Good Times. Like, they would have canceled Good Times if this many people were watching it, okay? This is how down television watching is from 40 years ago. But the show that I really want to talk about is Game of Thrones, which is going off this week. 17 million people are expected to watch Game of Thrones for whatever reason. 17 million people. And the only reason I note this is to say the fans of this show, the 17 million people who are watching, the less than 20% of people who watched J Who Shot JR, okay? A very small minority of Americans who are supposedly fans of this show hate the current season. They hate it. They hate it so much that 1.02 million people have signed a petition asking HBO to rewrite the final season. <laughs> 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 
one million people who are supposed fans are asking a show to be trashed and started over from the beginning. One million people! We are so good at grumbling. Can you imagine, can you imagine if you didn't like the arc of Webster's life writing into a TV network to tell them to try again? We have gotten so capable at grumbling and have figured out our power in grumbling, and we send grumbling up the channel as best we can. So what does God do with grumblers? This is a great question, I think. And my suspicion is, is that we think our immediate response is to think, yeah, God probably doesn't put up with grumbling too much. And maybe that's because I don't like grumbling too much. If you've parented it all, you've dealt with grumbling, right? And grumbling is aggravating, especially when they're grumbling about nothing. (laughs) Grumbling is so annoying, and we probably imagine that grumbling before God, God probably dislikes grumbling as much as we do. Can't you imagine God sitting on the throne up there looking down upon us and say, look at all the food you have. Look at the nice houses you have. Look at the cars you have. What are you upset about? But it appears that God doesn't respond to humanity in the same way we do. In fact, we're going to look at the story of the Exodus as kind of a 30,000-foot overview today. And that word grumbling shows up in the Exodus a lot, which is fascinating. It is a real ebb and flow of grumbling being a part of the story of the people of God's relationship with God. And the way that God deals with the grumbling is very, very different than we would deal with grumbling. And so I want to set the scene real quick with Joseph, who's one of my favorite characters in the entire scripture, certainly my favorite Old Testament character. His life story is an ebb and flow of ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. When he reaches the worst that life has to offer, God gives him away and lifts him up again. It's an incredible story, and his story ends with him being the number two official in the largest, most powerful nation in the world, Egypt. Fascinating that that an Israelite man would become the number two official in Egypt. And yet, Joseph's story ends with his death. He dies. And when he dies, a new Pharaoh comes to power, and he didn't know Joseph. And he looks, like all Pharaohs do, for threats. What are the threats to my power? And as he looks across his kingdom, he sees this race of people living inside of his kingdom, and he doesn't understand why they're there, how they got there, or who they are, but begins to understand that they could be a threat to his power. So he creates a narrative about how dangerous they are and then decides that he's going to deal with the danger that they create. And so, before they can recognize their potential power, he begins to oppress them so they can't have time to imagine a revolt. So he enslaves the Israelite people, a people who had lived calmly and peacefully amongst them for a generation. And he begins to work them hard, and they become slaves, and they struggle. And in their struggle, they begin to grumble. And as they grumble, Pharaoh gets tougher on them. And eventually Moses is raised up. And when Moses tells the Pharaoh to back off, he doubles down. We get to the point that these folks are working two shifts a day to reach absurd quotas that they'll never catch in order that they perpetuate their own slavery. This is the way Pharaoh decides he's going to deal with these Israelite people. We're told in chapter 2, that, um, that the people begin to understand that their slavery is a struggle. And so you may wonder, what do the people of God do when they're struggling, when they're enslaved, when life is unfair? I think we want to believe that the correct way to deal with such an oppressive, difficult time is that the Israelite people gathered together for a prayer meeting and asked for God to help them. But the story we get is very different. And I'm going to read it just real quick. We're going to read a longer text in a minute. But this is from Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. This is the story of the people responding to the slavery that they're put under. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. 
The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of, because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. That is not a very spiritual text. The people of God are enslaved, and they groan. They just groan, they moan, they whine, they complain. And God hears this. And God begins to imagine how he can help them on their behalf because he had made a covenant with their forefathers. This is really good news for us today. I don't know that I can give you better news than I can give you at this moment. Is that we don't always have to put together flowery words for God to hear us. That sometimes if the best we have is groaning because our situation is bad, that doesn't mean that God isn't listening. And God listens in such a profound way to his people here that he chooses to act on their behalf. Not because someone said a pretty prayer or because the church gathered around the altars on a Wednesday night. He heard their groaning and their misery. That's good news. That's good news. If you've come here today in the midst of groaning and misery, that does not preclude God from hearing where you're at. Even if you don't have great words to tell that story to God, God hears your prayers where you're at. And so God raises up Moses. Moses himself is a product of this enslavement. See, the thing that, that was added to the enslavement was that Pharaoh began to kill boys who were born, for, especially the firstborn boy, killing them so that an army couldn't rise up to face Egypt. And when Moses was born, his mother hid him in the reeds, and eventually the princess of Egypt found him and raised him into the, uh, the castle. And so Moses had this strange life of one foot in Israelite life and one foot in Egyptian life, and he was resented by the Israelite people as if he had a silver spoon in his mouth. And so he would come among the Israelite people, and they'd say, yeah, who, do, who do you think you are? You may look like us, but we know you're Egyptian. We, we know you're on the side of the power. You're not doing anything for us. And Moses was like, no, guys, I'm on your side. I'm with you. And one day, Moses saw how badly his Egyptian family was treating his Israelite family, that he welled up in anger and killed one of the people who were oppressing the Israelites. And you would think that would win favor with the Israelite people, but they're like, oh, great, now you're just going to make it worse for, for us, aren't you? And so now Egypt hated him and Israelite hated him, and he had to go be a refugee in a faraway country because no one liked him anymore. And that's the person that God called to save his people. Amazing how that works. And so Moses was sent back to Egypt and he goes back to Egypt, and he begins encountering the Pharaoh in the house that he was raised in. And he began telling him that God wanted to raise up the people and let them go, to go to a new promised land, free them from slavery. And Pharaoh said, uh, no thanks. And Moses says, yes, but God says this is going to happen. And Pharaoh says, and I've got profit margins to care for. And so they would have this argument. And finally, Moses began sending plagues through the power of God upon Egypt. And this escalated to the point that finally Pharaoh had had enough. And he let the people go. And they left Egypt. And there was this race to the Red Sea with the Egyptian army chasing. And Moses raised up his staff and the Red Sea parted. And the Israelite people walked through. And the waters came back on the Egyptian army. And the Israelites were now free. They were, they were now no longer slaves. They were not prisoners. They were free. And you would think this would be the best news that they could possibly come on. You would think that their history of grumbling because they were enslaved would now be finished. You would think that this new freedom with the power of God clearly on their side and a clear articulation of a future promised land that they were now headed toward would be an incredible gift that they would receive with open arms. You would be wrong. Because the Israelites were trained grumblers. They were trained grumblers. They knew how to grumble about their situation. And so I'm going to read a story from Exodus chapter 16. You're going to see pretty quickly that this story happens 45 days into their freedom. Okay? Not 45 years. Not like memory is hard to remember what slavery was like. About a month and a half later. Okay? So, like, you remember April Fool's Day? Can you remember having April Fool's Day? Wasn't long ago? About that long ago from now, they had been freed 
from slavery, okay? And here is the story of their wandering in the desert where they continue their grumbling. This is Exodus chapter 16. We're going to read verses 1 to 12. Would you join me in standing as we read the word of the Lord? The whole Israelite community set out on Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt. See where I get 45 days from? Okay. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Well, they can't groan against God, grumble against just God anymore. Now they've got to grumble against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Did I read that right? There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. They were slaves working 16 hours a day. 45 days later, they remember their slavery as just a big buffet in a pot? But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Another great connection. He has heard your grumbling. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it is the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in a cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. One of the questions that raises in my mind as I look at this text is, how do we define if we're doing okay? How do we judge whether or not we are okay? Psychologically, we have a problem of answering this question because we tend to do two things. One is we look towards the past and we manage to glorify the past beyond description. The past is always better than the present to us. No matter what statistics or the truth is, we always remember the past better than it was. Look at the Egyptian story here. They are now free. They are not working 16 hours a day. They get to reap the rewards of what they gather. They get to eat their own food, and they seem to remember only pots of food in Egypt, not the fact that it was so bad that they grumbled out to God. We do the same as well. The past always seems better than the present in our imagination. And so for some reason, we have this desire to go back. The other thing we do is that we judge ourselves by who's doing better than us and not necessarily who is doing worse than us. You may recall I said just a couple weeks ago that uh, if you've been to the DMV, you are among the 7% wealthiest in the world. People who own cars and can register a car, 7% of the world. And we don't think like that. We, we don't think that we're doing okay or wealthy because we're not measuring ourselves against refugee camps. We're not measuring ourselves against poorer nations. We are measuring ourselves against that person who owns a McMansion on the west side of the county. We can only see up. We so rarely can see down. So we struggle to understand okay because we're keeping a scorecard that is unfair. So it is with Israel as well. They're now wandering through the desert, and they, they're remembering Egypt better than it was. They're wandering between nations that have established places and buildings and fortresses and seeing stability, 
And they're measuring themselves against that. They're not measuring themselves by the fact that God opened the Red Sea for them. They're not measuring themselves by the fact that they were delivering from slavery. They're not measuring themselves by understanding that God has promised a land flowing with milk and honey on the other side of their journey. They're just looking what's around them in the past and saying, hey, this kind of stinks. We do the same thing. I read a story this week by uh, Dr. Keith Payne. He is, um, he is a professor at the University of North Carolina, and he talks about economic systems, and in particular, our understanding of inequality. And he says he came to understand in a single day as a child that he was poor. One day, it clicked in his brain that he was poor. Fourth grade, he had made it to fourth grade before understanding he was poor, had no concept for what poverty looked like, and didn't know that he was a part of poverty. So, how do you come to understand that you're poor? Just like that. How does that happen? Well, he was at school in the lunch line, and there was a substitute lunch person that day. And he was on the free and reduced lunch, so he would take his food and go sit down. And it never occurred to him that some kids were paying and some kids were not. This had never occurred to him. He just did what he did. And when he was in line, he got to the end, and the substitute lady said, that'll be $1.25. And he thought to himself, I don't have $1.25. How am I going to eat my lunch? And then, it, then his next occurrence was, some people have come to school armed with $1.25 to pay for their lunch. I get my lunch for free every day because my family doesn't have $1.25 to give me. And from then, his whole life was recolored. He now realized that he was poor. And he began to define himself as poor because of just one moment. His other students, his peers, were paying for their lunch, and he wasn't. He didn't understand this as a blessing. He understood this as a curse. He was poor, and that began to define himself. This sort of thing of defining ourselves happens not just in humans, but in the animal world as well. I've got a video that I'm going to show you that I think is hysterical. This video is, is like the pinnacle of humor to me. But you've got, it's kind of a TED Talk format, so you've got to walk through with what they're doing, okay? So give it a chance for him to set up the study, all right, and then watch it pay off in an incredible way. And you'll see how even animals have this way of not being able to be satisfied with what they get, but always wanting more. Check out this study real quick. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so 
so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. There's a whole lot that could be said about this video, but, but what I really want to talk about in particular isn't so much about being jealous or where it is we get our narratives from, but I want to talk about the definition of enough. This is a word that showed up in the text that we read today, enough. What is enough? You see, I, I believe, I deeply believe that God is blessing us in incredible ways and the way that we shape our narrative and understanding about who we are then shapes how we understand God's blessing in our life as well. Think about it this way. We live in or around Howard County, Maryland. Now, that could be great. It could be bad. Depends on your perspective. But truly and honestly, Howard County is about the pinnacle of American life, at least the American dream. There are few places in the world, let alone America, but the world where life is better than it is where we live. We have great jobs, beautiful homes that have stable value, amazing schools, incredible sports. Um, I mean, the Orioles play here, but they'll be good again. <laughs> Two major cities within an hour. We have recreation, shopping, dining, coffee shops, outdoor sports, beaches within two and a half hours, mountains within two and a half hours, uh, three major airports within an hour. This is an incredible place to live. It's incredible. And whether you have a conservative or liberal view of the good life, both of those narratives can be reached to their peak living here. We live such a blessed and good life. And in spite of that, in spite of the achievement and availability of the pinnacle of the American dream at our fingertips living here, we are not problemless. We have huge problems. There's still incredible struggling even in the midst of this reaching of incredible proportions in life. There is a, a lack of time in people's life, an incredible amount of busyness. Anxiety and depression exist. Opioid addiction is rising. There's poverty in our neighborhoods. There are young people who are dying all too soon. There are families who are breaking up amongst us. There's a great injustice inside of our communities. No matter how good the chasing of what we think we want as Americans can be at our fingertips, it has not solved the problems of our world. For every bit of further we can climb up the socioeconomic ladder, we see more views of struggle in people's lives. Winning at this life does not solve the problems of this world. And yet, it's important for us to ask, whose narrative is it that we're using to keep score? Is it the American dream that's telling us whether or not we have enough? Or is it our relationship to God and the promise of the kingdom that is coming that is telling us whether we have enough? We need to come to a good, better definition or understanding of that word enough. If we keep thinking the next thing we purchase or the next home we buy or the next school we get our kids into or the next team our children make or the next vacation we go on or the next car that we get is our definition of having enough, there's no end to that battle. There's no place that you will get to where you will finally say, okay, now I have enough things and so my life is good. There will always be someone who has something better than you that will always cause you to think you need more. And needing more is not the narrative of the kingdom. The narrative of the kingdom is God hearing a people who are struggling and responding on their behalf over and over and over. And sometimes the best promise that this God has is that there's a land flowing with milk and honey on the other side. And that doesn't mean that wandering in the desert and hoping that God shows up the next day to drop bread on the ground isn't a tough life. That's really hard. But it's enough. It's enough that God would give us a trajectory towards amazing things. For us, the kingdom of God seen fully in the return of Christ in heaven, 
what a great story we live into in the kingdom of God. And sometimes God just drops enough bread into our way in the morning and asks us that that would be enough. And man, sometimes that's hard to live in. But God keeps sustaining and giving, drawing us towards his kingdom in his final, in his final plan to save us. And that is good news. And that's exciting news. And if we live on that trajectory instead of the one in this world, and we understand that God is interacting with us, whether we're clear, or whether we're grumbling, whether we're struggling or things are good, if we understand the presence of God to be enough and his call towards his kingdom to be enough, we may find ourselves more satisfied than getting that next new car, more satisfied than getting that next new house, getting our kids into that right school, on and on and on. It is the call and trajectory of God in our lives that helps us understand we have been blessed and that maybe enough has already been achieved and that maybe joy doesn't come from accomplishing all that this world has to offer, but maybe joy comes from having a relationship with the one who yearns to save us. And by changing our definition from enough, from winning in this world, towards receiving what God would have for us, we may find that things like depression, anxiety, the struggles that we see are more easily defeated in the scorecard that God gives us than the world that the world gives us. And so the band is going to come out now and we're going to conclude. I'm going to talk about this a lot and I hope you hear this narrative a lot in my sermons, but I really deeply believe and see that we are living in a time that has changed so completely that faith development is a real struggle. It's difficult to be fully Christian in the cultural moment we find ourselves in. There are so many competing narratives and stories at our grasps that makes it very difficult to live fully into the story that God has called us to. It is a challenge, and it's a new challenge in this culture to be fully Christian. And I want to be a part in helping you thrive in that culture, finding ways to re-narrate our lives so that we can live the good life in Christ that he promises for us and not live in the struggle and rat race that this world is trying to pull you out into. I want to be a part of helping you re-narrate your life in a way that helps you find joy and peace and hope in the midst of a challenging world. That is my goal and my hope. And one of the ways I think I can most help you with that is by helping you define the word enough and looking around and seeing that God has blessed us in incredible ways. And maybe if we change our definition of enough, even just a little bit at a time, we may find that God's blessing has been overwhelming in our lives, and we can pull joy from that rather than pulling sadness from what we don't have. And so that's my hope and prayer. There's a lot of places to find yourself on the spectrum of this sermon today. You may be a person who is just grumbling, and you may be grumbling legitimately. God hears that prayer, and God answers that prayer and comes with his presence and help in the middle of that moment. You may be someone who is living in complete and utter blessing and yet can't find joy. God can help you through that as well, opening your eyes to see all that he is doing in your life for you. And there's a whole lot of places to find yourself between those extremes on the spectrum of faith journey. As we sing this song today, if any bit of this sermon has said, oh, I've got to adjust myself, one degree, two degrees, maybe even 90 degrees, I invite you to take a moment and come in quietness as we sing in prayer, kneel before God, and ask God to, to show you how it is you can adjust yourself to his vision for your life and respond and find that he yearns to bless you and help you and change your life for the better. Come and pray if God is calling you to do so. But in the meantime, would you join me in standing as we sing this concluding song? Mm -hmm.